There is much in the literature and popular media warning that the increase in atmospheric CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels will acidify the oceans to the detriment of marine life. The purpose of this experiment is to examine how much the pH of ocean water, which is highly buffered, will change with higher levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide. For teachers, this video is intended to augment the lesson plan, Ocean Acidification, Why Buffering Matters, which is designed for grades 8 through 12 and published by the CO2 Learning Center of the CO2 Coalition. Widely used education materials teach ocean acidification using bottled tap or distilled water, which are sensitive to absorbing carbon dioxide in the air, making them slightly acidic. Bottled spring water often contains minerals that make it slightly basic, but none of these waters contain buffering salt. In contrast, the salty oceans are highly buffered with calcium carbonate and bicarbonate. This means that ocean water resists a change in pH. The American Geophysical Union defines seawater as a solution with multiple weak acids and bases in contact with both the atmosphere and sediments containing minerals that have the potential to react when solution composition or physical conditions change. Consequently, seawater is well buffered. This means that buffered seawater resists a change in pH. That resistance, or buffering, is illustrated here. The current level of CO2 in the atmosphere is about 420 parts per million, or ppm. Doubling this level to 840 parts per million would result in a decline in pH to a level that's firmly basic but still within the range of natural variation experienced by ocean biota. Bottom line, the oceans can't turn acidic. This experiment is designed to illustrate that buffering effect. These are the materials needed. To simulate ocean water, you will need sea salt formulated for saltwater aquariums. A container, such as a half a gallon jug, distilled water, and a hydrometer. You will need to label four 8-ounce clear cups as shown. These can be glass or plastic. Other materials are a measuring cup of at least 300 milliliter capacity, antacid tablets, a 15-quart translucent container with a latchable lid, and aluminum foil. Romothymol blue was a pH-sensitive color indicator, a small eyedropper bottle, is ideal for use. If the pH color chart does not come with a bromothymol blue, it can be downloaded from the web. And finally, a CO2 meter will quantify the elevation of carbon dioxide in the closed container. Distilled water contains natural carbonation that renders it slightly acidic, with a pH in the range of 5.6 to 6.0. Boiling the distilled water removes this carbonation turning its pH neutral or slightly basic. This degassed and cooled distilled water serves as a control in this experiment. The use of tap or bottled water is not recommended because of its varying mineral content. Simulated ocean water can be made easily by adding a quarter cup of aquarium sea salts, such as that from Instant Ocean, to a half gallon jug half full of boiled distilled water. Using the hydrometer, Adjust the salinity with more water or sea salt to reach about 34 parts per thousand. The sea salt and hydrometer can be found online or at pet stores. Label four clear plastic or glass cups as shown. Then add 200 milliliters of boiled distilled water or simulated seawater to each cup per its label. Add 40 drops of bromothymol blue to each cup and stir. Record the pH of the solutions in each cup using the bromothymol blue color chart as a guide. Here we see that degassed distilled water has a neutral pH of 7, and our simulated seawater has a pH of about 8.1, which is typical of the world's oceans. Record the ambient air CO2 content in the room, making sure to calibrate the CO2 meter first. Because human breath will increase the CO2 reading, this is best done before the room is filled with students. 
Position the sensor of the CO2 meter on an inside wall or floor of the container. Place the two cups labeled high CO2 inside the container. These two cups are the experimental samples. The control samples should remain outside the container during the experiment. Then place the measuring cup filled with about 300 milliliters of tap water inside the container and add two antacid tablets to the measuring cup. Place a sheet of aluminum foil over the container, crimping the edges of the foil around the lip of the container, then cover with the lid and lock in place. This will provide a tighter seal and preserve elevated CO2 at greater than 5,000 parts per million for several hours. Note the change of color, or pH, of the sample exposed to high CO2 level with time. For example, after four hours as shown here. High CO2 samples are removed from the container and observed next to the control samples for the best comparison. After recording the results, return the two high CO2 samples to the container, replace the water in the measuring cup, add two antacid tablets to the measuring cup, and seal the container with a fresh sheet of aluminum foil, and then the lid. And here are the results for a 24-hour exposure to an atmosphere exceeding 5,000 parts per million of CO2. In this slide, we can see the progression of color change, representing a change in pH, with exposure to either the atmosphere of the room or to the highly elevated CO2 content of the closed container. The boiled distilled water control, left under conditions of the room with about 440 parts per million of CO2 in the air, showed a gradual decline of pH from 7.0 to about 6.4. This is as expected, as, for example, natural rainwater has a slightly acidic pH of about 5.5 from absorption of atmospheric carbon dioxide. The boiled distilled water exposed to an atmosphere greater than 5,000 parts per million of CO2 became solidly acidic by four hours with a pH much lower than 6.4. This is what widely used education materials misrepresent as acidification of seawater. Simulated seawater exposed to that same high level of carbon dioxide after 16 hours declined in pH from 8.1 to about 7.4. That is, buffered seawater remained solidly basic within the range of natural ocean water pH even after exposure to more than 10 times the current level of atmospheric carbon dioxide. The buffered seawater control remained at a pH of 8.1 throughout the experiment. So from this experiment, we can conclude that the degassed distilled water control demonstrates how easily water absorbs carbon dioxide. This is true for both fresh and salt water. In the case of our freshwater control, the pH dropped from 7.0 to 6.4. The unbuffered distilled water exposed to an excessively high level of CO2 rapidly turns firmly acidic with a pH of much less than 6.4. Buffered simulated seawater under an atmosphere containing over 10 times the CO2 of today's air declines to a pH of about 7.4 but remains firmly basic. The pH of the buffered seawater control doesn't change, indicating that absorption of ambient CO2 from the air doesn't change its pH as it does with the freshwater. And finally, the level of CO2 in this experiment is unrealistically high, and it doesn't reflect reasonable or probable increases in the world's ambient CO2. It does, however, demonstrate the strong resistance of a buffered solution to a change in pH. The bottom line is that buffering matters. Any future increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide from natural causes or from the burning of fossil fuels would result in an atmospheric CO2 level significantly below the extremes of this experiment. The corresponding decrease in ocean pH would still be firmly basic and thus not endanger sea life. It is still worth noting that educational material from major publishers either ignore or purposefully avoid the impact of buffering, which misleads students on the real potential harm to ocean biota. Only an experiment that uses seawater 
can accurately reflect the sensitivity of the oceans to acidification. Experimental protocol that does not measure the level of CO2 avoids the impact of the greater than 5,000 parts per million of CO2 level generated by antacid tablets. This level is about two and a half times that of the atmospheric CO2 content when precursors to today's corals and other hard-shelled marine life evolved. For a thorough overview of the impact of this deceptively described acidification on ocean life, see the Ocean Health White Paper, published by the CO2 Coalition.